take some questions? Sure, I'll, I'll take some, gladly take some questions. Sir, there's somebody right dead center there. You should just talk, do they have a microphone? Oh yeah, there's a microphone. Um, sir, in 1994, you were very vocal about uh, Ukraine surrendering its nuclear arsenal to Russia. Um, and I just wanted to know, in your opinion, is the annexation of Crimea a vindication of your opposition to Ukraine <laughs> surrendering its nuclear weapons? Yeah. Uh, I, I wrote a piece, for those of you who don't, who don't know, uh, in 1993, arguing that Ukraine should not give up its nuclear weapons because one day the Russians would come knocking and they would have good use uh, for their nuclear weapons. So the gentleman's question is, given that the Russians uh, conquered or annexed Crimea uh, in 2014, uh, would that not be the case if they had nuclear weapons? Uh, and would I uh, therefore be vindicated? <laughs> I'm tempted to say, of course. Uh, but I don't think the answer is, of course. Uh, I don't think uh, that uh, Ukrainian, if, if Ukraine had kept its nuclear weapons and, and had a formidable nuclear deterrent, I do not believe uh, that it would have stopped Russia from taking Ukraine. And I don't believe that Ukraine would have used nuclear weapons to prevent it from happening. I do think, and I can't prove this, this is just my intuition, uh, I do think that it would have gone a long way towards keeping the Russians out of eastern Ukraine. Uh, I think that uh, if Ukraine had nuclear weapons and had started to threaten to use them, uh, if the Russians intervened in eastern Ukraine, that there's a good chance that that would have worked. Uh, but one can never be 100% certain. I mean, one of the problems here, and this is a point that I related to a point that I tried to drive home here. You can never be certain that nuclear weapons won't be used. Right? This is my problem with the nuclear revolution argument. You can never be certain that they won't be used. You also can't be certain that they will be used. Because again, they are weapons of mass destruction. And countries don't use these weapons lightly. And also, in the case of Russia and Ukraine, because of the geographical proximity, it's much more difficult for Ukrainians to think about lobbying nuclear weapons into Western Russia when you think about all the consequences regarding fallout and so forth and so on. So uh, I think it would have been good for Ukraine if it had those nuclear weapons, but not for purposes of keeping Crimea. Sir, uh, ma'am. Okay, uh, I'll repeat the question, and please correct me if I don't get it exactly right. Her, her question is that uh, the North Koreans uh, would like significant uh, relief from the sanctions that we have on them, and in return they will dismantle significant parts of their nuclear inventory. And she asked me what my advice would be to, um, to President Trump on how to deal with the North Koreans. My view is the North Koreans would be crazy to give up their nuclear weapons, right? I'm not talking about from an American point of view. I think whenever you think about nuclear weapons, you want to think about what's in America's interest and then what's in the interest of the other country. For example, if I were an Iranian national security advisor, Iran would already have nuclear weapons. Right? This is not in America's interest. Right? It's not in America's interest, I want to be clear. It's not in America's interest for North Korea to have nuclear weapons. It is in North Korea's interest to have nuclear weapons. 
Right. I remember Ehud Barak, former Israeli prime minister, said about Iran, he said, the reason to think that Iran is pursuing nuclear weapons is because it makes so much sense. <laughs> Just think about that statement. He, of course, is correct. Right. But anyway, so my view is they're not going to give them up. And this is all just one giant waste of time. And uh, I don't know what to say beyond that. Uh, I, I think that it is important for the United States to be very careful with the North Koreans. Because again, as I've emphasized here, if the North Koreans get really scared, they could use a nuclear weapon. Again, not likely, but they could. And given the consequences, I don't want to see that happen. But the other thing that you have to remember about the North Korean case, and it's what really distinguishes it from the Iran case, is that North Korea has a benefactor. There are just real limits to how rough we can get with the North Koreans, because the Chinese don't want us getting rough with the North Koreans. Remember, when we crossed the 38th parallel in the fall of 1950, it was the Chinese who came in. And when we fought the Korean War from 1950 to 1953, we were not fighting the North Koreans. It was the Americans against the Chinese. The Chinese made it manifestly clear in 1950 to 53, that North Korea is of huge strategic importance to them. And I believe if the North Korean regime, for example, were to implode tomorrow, the Chinese would be in there like that. The last thing they want to happen is to have a unified Korea under South Korean auspices, which means the Americans are up on the Yalu River, right? But just with regard to nuclear weapons, it's very tough for us to get tough. It's very tough for us to get tough with North Korea because if we threaten to bring the regime down, that automatically triggers Chinese intervention. In the case of Iran, if we are able, and I don't think we'll pull this off, but if we're able to bring the Iranians to their knees, at this point in time, there's nobody who will come to Iran's rescue. So I think this is a hopeless situation, and we just have to live with the fact that China, excuse me, that North Korea is going to have nuclear weapons for the foreseeable future and do everything we can to make sure we don't have a nuclear war. Sir. Thanks very much, Professor Mearsheimer. One quick question. Just given China's relatively small nuclear arsenal, at least at present, do you think they ascribe to the manipulation of risk strategy? Uh, I think that they have to subscribe to a manipulation of risk strategy. I mean, here's what you want to think about. You want to think about how you can use nuclear weapons. This is the thorniest issue. I, 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 gave, I, I actually wrote my talk out, and I gave the paper to a couple young friends of mine. And they, their view was, John, nobody's ever going to use nuclear weapons. Right? It's just not going to happen. That told me it was incumbent upon me to make a case that there are scenarios where they can be used. Okay? So the question you have to ask yourself is, how can you use these things not only in ways that give you military advantage, but also so that you don't get vaporized. You understand what I'm saying? You don't want to get vaporized. It's not a good thing, right? <laughs> and, and, and when you're dealing with nuclear weapons, that possibility is always out there, OK? Now, nuclear first strike, splendid first strike, that's one possibility. Not possible for the Chinese. Damage limitation. Not possible. I mean, they're dealing with the United States of America, you know, which has got you know, a huge number of warheads. Just not going to happen. They can't do first strike. They can't do damage limitation. I, I don't believe in escalation dominance and haven't talked about it, but they can't do escalation dominance either. They're left with nothing but manipulation of risk. You know, what else are they going to do? And I, I just say to you, if you're the United States of America, and you think there's a really good chance that you have either a splendid first strike capability or a damage limitation capability against China. You get into a conflict, say over the East China Sea, and for some reason you decide it's appropriate to use nuclear weapons. 
I think that the Americans, even if they think there's a really good chance they have damage limitation or first strike capabilities, will first go to manipulation of risk because it only involves a handful of nuclear weapons, right? And I think, you know, the fear of escalation, right, uh, may be so great that, you know, you don't want to just really uh, go full blast. I'm not saying that's true, but I think in the Chinese case, they really just, they have no choice. Sir. Do you think in the long run that investments in China, uh, as much as investments in um, upgrading its nuclear arsenal will help compensate for the structural weaknesses in its conventional capabilities? His question was wh whether or not I think that Russia investing such great resources at the nuclear level will compensate in smart ways or effective ways for the fact that it's not invested as much money in uh, conventional forces, because they're robbing Peter to pay Paul, that kind of argument. Uh, I think the answer is yes. I mean, I think if you're playing their hand, that's the smart thing to do. Uh, I, I was in, uh, at the Valdai conference in Russia uh, two years ago and talked to all sorts of uh, Russian leaders. Um, and uh, the Russians don't want an arms race with the United States. Uh, the Russians are well aware that one of the key factors that wrecked the Soviet Union was spending all that money on defense. They understand that their economy is basically a giant gas station and that what they have to do is modernize the economy. And they understand that spending lots of money on defense is not the way to do that. And one of the reasons they would like to spend money on nuclear is it, uh, nuclear weapons is because of the more bang for the buck rationale that the Eisenhower administration laid out in the 50s. Most of you are too young to remember this, but there was a time in the 1950s, George Humphreys was the Secretary of the Treasury, when Republicans actually believed, really believed, in a balanced budget. And they thought that Harry Truman had spent out the gazoo and it was crazy they were spending all this money on defense. So the Republicans came to power and they wanted to get more bang for the buck. And what they did was they spent more money on nuclear weapons and really downgraded spending on conventional forces. You could argue that the strategic circumstances were such in the 50s that that made good strategic sense as well. And you can argue in the Russian case today that it makes good strategic sense to rely on nuclear over conventional. And it also makes good economic sense because then you can limit how much money you spend on defense and hopefully do things to refurbish your economy. But I think either way, the, Rus the Russians are in real trouble. This is a declining great power over the long term. The real threat for the United States is China. Last question, Last question. sorry. Somebody back there has their hand up. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Mearsheimer. Um, so I guess we should consider um, how a minor power that has not yet gone nuclear might look at the situation in Ukraine and the results thereof, going back to the first question. And I feel this is very timely because, turns out, President Nursultan Nazarbayev of Kazakhstan has just resigned. So we don't know what the next leadership will look like. We don't know how they'll be thinking. You've talked about how we don't know how future leaders of foreign powers will think. If you're Kazakhstan, what has to go right or go wrong for you to consider building up a nuclear arsenal, maybe something very minor, type four, and what would the implications of that be for great power politics in the region? Uh, I don't know much about Kazakhstan. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, Kazakhstan, when, when the Soviet Union collapsed, as many of you know, four countries ended up with nuclear weapons on their territory, uh, not necessarily under their control. Uh, most people believe the Russians maintained control, but there's no question that Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Ukraine all ended up with nuclear weapons on their territory. And the Kazakhs gave it up uh, pretty easily. Uh, my, my sense is that Kazakhstan doesn't face any great threats, and therefore there's no real incentive to acquire nuclear weapons. It's not easy to acquire nuclear weapons. They're expensive, and furthermore, the Russians will go to great lengths to make sure they don't 
develop nuclear weapons, and we, of course, will as well. I believe the Russians and the Amer this is one issue the Russians and the Americans and probably the Chinese will work together on. So I don't think that's the problem. I think if you look out at the nuclear proliferation front today, uh, the scenario you want to keep your eye on is Iran, Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, the United States, as you know, has walked away from the JCPOA, and if the Iranians walk away from the JCPOA and they start to enrich uranium, uh, the uh, Saudis have made it clear that they're going to enrich uranium. And if the Iranians begin to get a bomb because they act the way Ehud Barak and John Mearsheimer think they should, right, and they start moving down that road, the Saudis will be right behind them. And then if you begin to look around the region, you start thinking about the Turks, you start thinking about the Iraqis, you start thinking about the Egyptians. You think they're going to be happy with a situation where Iran and Saudi Arabia are getting nuclear weapons and they don't have them? I don't think so. Uh, this is one of the reasons I think walking away from the JCPOA was a really stupid thing to do. I mean, the administration is betting that they can bring the, uh, uh, the Iranians to their knees and take this problem off the table forever. Uh, that may happen. Who's to say it won't for sure? But I would not bet a lot of money on that. And I'd bet my money that the Iranians will eventually develop nuclear weapons or certainly get back into the business of enriching. And once they get into the business of enriching and the Saudis follow suit, dot, dot, dot. But uh, that, that's the scenario I keep my eye on today. Uh, I wouldn't worry uh, much about Kazakhstan. And I think, fortunately, from our point of view, uh, extended deterrence appears to be working reasonably well, uh, despite all of President Trump's efforts to you know, do serious damage, apropos Charlie's comments this morning, uh, to uh, the alliances in both Europe and especially in Asia. Uh, but as long as we're able to keep you know, those alliances intact, uh, and extended deterrence remains uh, a viable idea. Those countries don't have an incentive to get nuclear weapons. But, uh, but if, if extended deterrence falls apart and Iran begins to enrich, boy, you're opening Pandora's box. Uh, and it won't be Kazakhstan. Thank you. Please join me in thanking John.